All right, so <clears throat> let's go back to Kansas. And while the election is happening, there was a new governor down there, uh, John Geary, I think, and he kind of pacifies the violence for a period of time. Okay, and he comes in. He's an appointee of Franklin Pierce, so he is a pro-slavery Democrat coming in. But like, but like the other guy, I forget his name. He, he is so appalled by the, you know, I, you know, activities of the pro-slavery faction that he um, <clears throat> becomes an anti-slavery guy. This Geary guy, right? And so. <clears throat> But basically what has happened is that they are the pro-slavery faction is planning a constitutional convention in which they're going to draft a radically pro-slavery constitution for Kansas. And they have said that the election of delegates will be under the control of local officials throughout Kansas, all of whom are pro-slavery and all of whom will ensure pro-slavery delegates are elected through voter intimidation and fraud, presumably. And this guy Geary comes in realizes what's happening is completely corrupted and <clears throat> starts to condemn it and starts to call on, you know, uh, for uh, <laughs> uh, fair voting practices. And so then he becomes the target. His life is, is under threat all the time from these ruffians from Missouri. Okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> so the elect delegates to the Constitutional Convention, okay, under <laughs> corrupt premises. They also um, elect a pro-slavery legislature also through voter corruption. So for instance, there was like one like one county or something within Kansas had like 130 registered voters in it, but like 2,000, 1,000 to 2,000 like votes. Like, you know, clearly there weren't that many people able to vote in that county. So, but so complete voter fraud to elect pro-slavery legislature. That election is thrown out. They're going to have a new, like, fair election. But the pro-slavery faction has already got their delegates elected for a constitutional convention for Kansas. And they go to Lecompton, Kansas, and draft a pro-slavery constitution, which protects property rights above all other things for uh, Kansas people. And they basically provide sort of like a, a – they, you know, they, um, they have – the final document has two options, okay, um, for Kansas people to vote on because the whole idea is that um, what the pro-slavery faction wants is they want to send a pro-slavery constitution to Congress without submitting it to popular appeal, uh, to popular vote in Kansas to approve or disapprove of the Constitution because they know if they submit it to popular vote, a pro-slavery Constitution would lose because you've got a, a majority <coughs> free soiler anti-slavery population in Kansas. So they don't want the people to vote on it in Kansas, but Congress demands that they allow a referendum to take place in Kansas. So then what happens is the pro-slavery delegates of the Constitution draft like two options. The first option is to say, like, look, um, um, a constitution that obviously clearly protects and allows slavery in Kansas. Then a second option, which says that um, we will not allow slavery in Kansas. However, anyone who has slaves will, like, that, that right of owning the slaves will be protected. Okay, so the idea was, like, look, if you could get slaves into Kansas once you got them in there, they would be protected. So there wouldn't really be any point in Kansas being a free state. Okay. So in either case, the anti-slavery faction sees this as a joke. They call it the great swindle, and they're not going to vote for the for the constitution with or without slavery, because the whole constitution, the whole point of it, either either option is to protect slavery. Okay. Now finally you get some Democrats standing up to this nonsense. Um, Stephen Douglas, who's not, like, I'm not, a, he's not a good role model at all, but he at least recognizes the corruption of the situation in Kansas, demands that the new president who won the election of 1856, Buchanan, do something about it. Buchanan refuses to challenge the Southern faction because he knows that he owes everything to the Southern faction. That's who elected him in 1856 and so within the Democrat Party. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's not working out. Um, meanwhile, the um, uh, <clears throat> free soilers are finally getting a little bit more organized, okay? And, um, 
you have two referendums that take place in Kansas. The first one organized by the pro-slavery people in which the constitution with slavery is approved. And then the free soilers have a, a second vote, a second referendum, which is, um, you know, resulting in the constitution being rejected. And so both of these are sent to Congress. Um, <clears throat> And so Congress is now, we're getting into 1858 here, and Congress is divided, of course, between those who want to approve the Kansas Constitution with slavery and those who want to approve the Kansas Constitution, uh, not at all, <laughs> because there were two referendums to reject the Kansas Constitution, okay? All right, um, what was called the, the pro-slavery Constitution is the Lecompton Constitution, all right. Now, Douglas comes out against the Lecompton Constitution. The Democrat Party is divided over the issue. The, the Southerners have enough influence within the party to ensure that the pro-slavery Constitution in Kansas passes in the Senate. In the House, there's more of a question as to whether it's going to pass. And it, there's like fist fight. There's a fist fight that breaks out. There's all sorts of uh, it's intense debate uh, over this whole thing. And then finally, the House defeats the pro-slavery constitution in Kansas in 1858, okay? And <clears throat> by this time, the free soilers are more organized and they um, are able to elect a new legislature and new delegates to another constitutional convention who begin crafting a constitution that is anti-slavery, that reflects the, the voters' wishes in Kansas and that will bring Kansas into the Union as a free state in 1861, okay? And by 1861, you'll have California, Minnesota, Oregon, and then Kansas coming in as free states, which will give the North four state advantage over the South in terms of the number of free states versus slave states, okay? Now, in the meantime, in 1858, violence has broken out again within Kansas. The, the sort of ceasefire ended. Um, that Geary guy left... <laughs> Couldn't, you know, it was too much. And then, so what happens is the uh, pro-slavery people kidnap uh, a bunch of free, free soilers, nine free state settlers on the second anniversary of John Brown's Potawatomi massacre, and they murder them. And then John Brown goes into Missouri territory, kills a slaveholder, liberates 11 slaves, okay, and then uh, takes them up into Canada. Okay, so the violence break is, is renewed, okay, but finally the Free Soilers are organized enough to make sure that the elections are going forward in their favor, and they're going to make sure that uh, going forward, Kansas is going to become a free state, and one of the most Republican states in the Union from 1861 onward, all right?